honored to have Rachel Lacey Borsba with us tonight. And uh, I'll give you a little background. I printed it off here. Um, she, she always downplays her background. Oh, there's not much to say about me, right? <laughs> So Rachel has, or I should say Professor Lacey Borsma, has a BA in Theatre and French from the University of Arizona, an MA in Theatre Studies, University of Ottawa, and she's in the middle of a PhD, or finishing up a PhD in many ways, uh, in English at the University of British Columbia. Rachel Lacey has taught English at Corpus Christi College and has published in Shakespeare Bulletin. Her research interests include early modern drama and the English cycle uh, plays, sacramental theology and the Reformation, materialist philosophy, and historical semiotics. Tonight, she's presenting um, on the Magdalen Ophelia and repentance in Hamlet. So it's wonderful to have you here, Rachel. Uh, Rachel is also a friend of ours and and we're very grateful for her because she brings us food all the time. And, uh, and so I blame her for my expanding waistline. Um, anyway, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Kaylin. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you all for coming. It's a real privilege to be here, not just to be invited by CBC to talk, but just a privilege to be here um, this talk was scheduled for March and it had to be cancelled because of the pandemic. So I'm thankful that I can still give it, albeit to a smaller audience. Still, I think maybe the talk tonight will show us something of how important physical presence is to the building of community. Um, at least that's something that I think theatre can show us. So when Dr. Kaitler was introducing my CPC3 lecture last time, when it was still upcoming in March, he, he sort of gave this pitch that, oh, Rachel's going to be talking about Hamlet, and uh, which, by the way, Tolkien didn't like Shakespeare, so. <laughs> and I don't know if you meant it as that, Dr. Kaitler, but I took it as a challenge, okay, to vindicate the ways of the bard to man. So I'll start with that. Why Tolkien didn't like Shakespeare? Well, it's not that Tolkien didn't like Shakespeare. It's that he didn't like the study of Shakespeare. In a letter he wrote, he said, he couldn't stand the folly of reading Shakespeare and annotating him in the study. So what Tolkien disliked was Shakespearean analysis. But on one occasion, Shakespeare came alive to him and Tolkien wrote of this moment in a letter to his son. It was a performance of Hamlet. Tolkien writes, but to my surprise, the part that came out as the most moving, almost intolerably so, was the one that in reading I had always found a bore, the scene of Madophilia singing her snatches. So why did Tolkien find this moment so moving? And why was Ophelia the exception to his no Shakespeare rule? Well, those of you who have read Hamlet can testify to how boring the sequence of Ophelia reading her, or singing her snatches is to read. And those of you who haven't read it can probably imagine how boring it is to read. So Ophelia is the heroine of Shakespeare's probably best known tragedy, Hamlet. And she comes onto the stage in Act 4, Scene 5, stark raving mad. She delivers an incoherent monologue. She sings snatches of different tunes. She talks a little bit about flowers, and then she goes off stage. So tonight I'd like to examine why this moment was so compelling to Tolkien. It's interesting because Ophelia is a relatively minor character in the play, but without a doubt, she's inspired the richest visual tradition of any of Shakespeare's heroines. So here is a, an excerpt from John William Waterhouse's one of his three portraits of Ophelia. We're also all familiar with um, John Everett Millay's Ophelia canvas. And then here, of course, is Waterhouse's full canvas and his two other studies of her. So just these are examples of how 
how much she has inspired visual artists to this day. In fact, you can probably think of some sort of work of visual art um, that deals with Ophelia. Simply put, she's an iconic character. But what's so interesting about this is that she's only a shadow of a character in the play itself. She appears in only six out of the 20 scenes in Hamlet, and in one of those scenes she's dead. So it's really just her body that's a prop. So she's really only present in one quarter of the play. I think that Ophelia's sort of piecemeal and very secondary character construction is a clue here to explaining why she's so alluring visually, why she sparks our imagination. I propose tonight to look at Ophelia as a series of images rather than as a fully rounded out dramatic persona like Hamlet is. And I think doing so will help us explain, will explain why Tolkien found her so compelling on the stage, but boring on the page. Now this may seem odd to look at a dramatic character as a series of images, but if we think about the fact that characters are in fact dramatic constructs, just like um, the Ophelia here is a, a, a constructed image by a painter, then I think looking at the way Ophelia's character is put into performance, this includes the images, the costume, uh, the images associated with her, her character, so her costume, her gestures, her body language, these sorts of things. These have something to do with appreciating the character of Ophelia in particular. And it's important to remember because, after all, Shakespearean drama was written to be performed and not to be read. Now, any look to Ophelia's visuality has to consider some of the debates about images that were occurring around the writing of Hamlet as a result of the English Reformation. So the first part of my talk gives a historical background on these theological debates on images in order to contextualize a reading of Ophelia in which I try to uncover a historical way of seeing her, seeing her in a way that Shakespeare's original audiences might have seen her. I think in this context, in the historical context, her imagery or the images associated with her performance have important things to tell us about the relationship between theology and drama and even a little bit about how the way we read English literature today and the legacy of the Reformation. Some brief ideas pertaining to that I'll discuss in conclusion. But even before I get to the historical background, I think some summary is in order for those of you who either haven't read Hamlet or haven't read Hamlet in a long time. So Hamlet, Shakespeare's well-known tragedy, is the story of a Danish prince who discovers that his uncle killed his father in order to become king and to marry Hamlet's mother, Queen Gertrude. In the first moments of the play, old King Hamlet's ghost returns from the grave to reveal the secret of his murder to his son and to charge Prince Hamlet with revenge. So this occurs in the opening act. The following five acts show, first, Hamlet's attempt to prove the murder and the veracity of the ghost's testimony. Second, to move his mother Gertrude to repentance. And third, to kill his uncle the king and enact revenge. So we can see here that repentance is a central motif in the play, tied up with its own genre as a revenge tragedy. But it's also tied up, I'd like to show, with other theological concerns such as penance and purgatory. But back to Ophelia. Complicating Hamlet's personal crises is his off and on relationship with Ophelia. And the interesting thing is a lot is made of the romance between Hamlet and Ophelia, but very little is actually said in the play. We know that Hamlet teases Ophelia by writing her love letters. He makes deranged innuendos when he pretends to go mad or does go mad. But things get really bad when Hamlet mistakes Polonius, Ophelia's father, for Claudius, the king, and kills him. So, Polonius dies, Ophelia goes off her rocker, as we can imagine that the romance kind of ends there. We learn after she goes crazy that she's drowned in a river off stage. But importantly, 
We never know if her death is an accident or a suicide. Okay, is she really sad that her father died? Is she despondent that Hamlet has betrayed her? Theories abound, but the fact is Ophelia remains a mystery to this day. A real mystery. Flannery O'Connor mentions in her treatise on teaching literature that the job of the fiction writer is to capture mystery in the manners or conventions of, of a genre. Here it would be drama. So as readers of fiction, I think our job is likewise to respect that mystery, um, not to try to solve it. I don't want to look at Ophelia tonight like a riddle we crack the code to. I think that this sort of approach involves imposing readings on the text that ne aren't necessarily appropriate to it. I propose rather to sort of meditate on the mystery of Ophelia and how do we do that? I think that's by focusing on what is given to us of her character and what is given to us of her character is a rich visual aspect. So I propose that we look at Ophelia differently. Well, that we just look at her. So what did Ophelia look like? The first quarto version of Hamlet in Act 4, Scene 5, has the following stage direction. Enter Ophelia playing on a lute with her hair down singing. So we know that Ophelia, when she goes crazy and starts singing her snatches, has her hair unbound and she's playing on a lute. I'd like to take a moment here with the stage direction because it's important to note how rare it is. The texts we have of Shakespeare's plays weren't written by Shakespeare's hand, in Shakespeare's hand by himself, in the style of the Shakespeare in um, the film Shakespeare in Love. Shakespeare wasn't writing his dramas in a study by himself. Um, he was part of an acting troupe that devised these plays, and only after the fact, after they were quite popular and someone realized if they, if they could print the plays, they could make some money off of it, were these plays transcribed. So the texts we have of Hamlet, and we have various texts, almost, well, actually any of the texts of Shakespeare's plays contain very few stage directions. Shakespeare embeds his stage directions in the dialogue usually. So example, um, let us go off to the forest to find the queen is an example of time to exit for that character, right? So he embeds the stage directions in the dialogue. Very rarely is there an original stage direction. If you pick a play off the shelf of Hamlet and you read it, nine times out of 10, the stage directions you find are editor's interpolations. They've done the work for you. They've, um, they've taken the hints from the stage directions in the embedded, dial embedded in the dialogue, and they've written it down for you so you can better understand what's going on. But here is an example of an original stage direction. It's furthermore remarkable, not just because it's there and it's original, but that it's so detailed. Um, stage directions about hairstyle or props are simply unheard of in the Shakespearean corpus. So the very specificity of this direction catches our attention. The unbound hair and the lute are so necessary to the aspect of Ophelia's performance that they merit specific mention. Of course, this, this causes us to ask why. Why are these traits important? I think the answers to these questions are a little bit involved. And so before we can even approach them, it's time to give some historical background about the context in which Shakespeare was writing. Well, this background is a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. Um, but my goal in providing this background is to set up an argument for trying to look at Ophelia with the historical, um, the historical gaze that would have been appropriate to Shakespeare's original audiences or Hamlet's original audiences. So let's zoom out for a moment and look at the time in which Shakespeare was writing. So he was writing in an age of revolution, revolution in every sense religious revolution, political revolution, social revolution, cultural revolution. In fact, we might say that the first two caused the second two. That is, the reformation of English religion and politics provoked an overhaul of nearly every aspect of life as Shakespeare knew it. 
His career spanned the 25 years from the reign of Elizabeth I to James VI, who comes after Elizabeth. I have actually included him on this timeline, which was part of the period we now recognize as the English Reformation. So the English Reformation actually began sort of formally. It's kind of hard to know exactly where it began, but in 1534, when Henry VIII enacted the Act of Supremacy. What this effectively did was reject the Pope's authority in England and establish the monarch as head of a new national church, the Church of England, what we now know as the Anglican Church. So Henry's separation from the Catholic Church came for his own personal reasons, but the fact was that it came at a time of widespread theological reform across Europe. So it effectively set England on track to become a Protestant nation. And so when his heir, Edward VI, inherited the throne on the death of his father, this is exactly the direction in which he steered England. However, Edward's reign was short and his death was premature. So he left the Reformation incomplete. While on paper a Protestant nation, culturally, England was still very Catholic. So when Mary I succeeded Edward VI, the country was thrown into confusion. Mary was Catholic, and she, I, she, her idea was that the quicker she could return England to the Catholicism of Henry VIII's early years, the quicker she could establish stasis and, um, and spare future bloodshed. So she adopts a zero-tolerance policy on Protestantism, executing nearly 300 people in three years. So these are public executions. So that's watching someone die once every three days. It's kind of hard to overstate the trauma of all of this bloodshed. But perhaps, but just as tragic was the fact that even Mary's reign was short-lived and so there was another revolution with Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I who succeeded her, returned England to the Protestantism of her father, and although she did punish Catholics for their faith, her attempt was a bloodless return to Protestantism, um, which was, uh, of course, marked contrast to Bloody Mary, Mary the first we now call Bloody Mary. So by and large, she was successful. We understand the Elizabethan age is a golden age, and this is when Shakespeare is writing. So my, my, the, the point of this overview here is to imagine for a second the experience of an everyday English person at this time. One of Shakespeare's contemporaries gives us insight into this experience. He writes, In one man's memory, we have had to our prince a man who abolished the Pope's authority by his laws and yet in other points kept the faith of his fathers. That's Henry VIII. We have had a child who by his like laws, like unto his father, abolished together with the papacy the whole ancient religion. So that's Edward. We have a woman who restored both again, both the papacy and the old religion, and sharply punished Protestants, that's Mary. And lastly, her majesty that now is Elizabeth I, who by the like laws hath long since abolished both again, and now severely punisheth Catholics, as the other did Protestants, and all these strange differences within the compass of about 30 years. This is strange indeed. Not only is it odd that England should go from Protestant to Catholic back to Protestant again, but that they should do it, that it should do it within the compass of one man's memory in 30 years. No wonder the author here seems perplexed. This is very strange. He doesn't know what to think. He and his countrymen don't know what to believe. They don't know what to remember. They don't know what to forget. I think this confusion is easier to overlook in our day when religion is more or less a private and individual matter. But in late medieval England, religious identity was cultural identity. The average English person was born and baptized in his local church which, by the way, was situated at the center of the city, at the heart of civic and economic life. 
His name would have been imprinted in the parish register, which function now sort of like civic records do. And above his name would have been his ancestors with their birth date and their death dates. And then below his name would be his children. So this Englishman would measure his life by the sacramental program of the church, of baptism, confirmation, marriage, last rites. And most of his friends and family would have done the same. So by and large, religion in late medieval, early sort of Shakespearean England, was not a matter of individual choice. Sure, it was for theologians or lay apologists or religious dissenters. But the average person lived a received Christianity. Before the Henrician Reformation, it was received from the church, from tradition, the magisterium, and the pope. But thereafter, it was received from the monarch. So this is the, a woodcut cut to the Great Bible, which was one of the first English translations of the Bible, which shows Henry VIII giving the word of God, as says verbum Dei, to the people. So instead here, we see in sort of the, instead this idea of receiving um, Christianity or the scriptures from, um, from the church, we see it directly come from the hands of the monarch. So consider, what if those two authorities disagreed? The authority of the monarch and the authority of the church, Catholic church. So example, you were wed under the belief that marriage was a sacrament and then 10 years later, you're told this is not the case. Okay, so how would you look at your spouse then? Maybe with a little bit of confusion. Or imagine receiving the Eucharist under the assumption that it was physically the body and blood of Christ, and five years later, transubstantiation is repudiated, celebrating the Mass is illegal. That's quite the change. Now say that one year you go to confession before Easter, and the next year, it's no longer a sacrament. How would you perceive confession? So probably with some confusion. On this point of confession, theology changed by shades and degrees during the Reformation. The practice was retained in certain parts of the church and still is present in the English church at various times and in various ways. But after the Reformation, it was not considered a sacrament. So the reformed version of confession emphasized internal contrition over external action. And likewise, the English version of confession was not considered to have any sort of eternal purchase. That is, um, while a priest might assure, a priest of the Church of England might assure the penitent of God's general forgiveness, his assurance didn't enact that forgiveness as it does in the Catholic model of the sacrament. So the words, so, so Catholics understand the words of absolution to be effective. When the priests pronounce the absolution, that it is affected, effected. But this was no longer the case under the English conception of confession. So you can see here a sort of epistemological um, struggle here. If the Catholic penitent knows he is forgiven when he hears the words of absolution, insofar as he trusts the authority of the church in its teaching as founded in Christ's mandate, then the English penitent has a lot less clarity. How do I know I have, for, I have been forgiven if there's no absolution? How do I know when I have been forgiven if I can't hear the words of absolution? Who's to say that I've been forgiven if the monarch says one thing and the church says another, the church of um, the Catholic Church says another? So in this confusion about confession and indeed in the, in the transference of a sacramental theology from, from the period of Catholic England to the period of Reformed England, the question of materiality or the role of the material world of things, of actions, of matter in general um, caused a great deal of, reform, uh, of anxiety for the English reformers. So the Catholic understanding of confession has something to do with the Catholic understanding of sin as being a twofold wrong. Uh, first, it's a wrong against God. It damages our relationship with God. And that's something that can be made right through confession and absolution. 
But there's also the sin against nature, something which requires material restitution. So if I've stolen something, I have to give it back. If I've taken money, I have to repay it. Um, if there's something I've done at really any sin, it damages the body of Christ. So there has to be something done to restore that relationship. This is the concept of penance. In Catholic theology, absolution and penance go hand in hand. But this action of penance, this sort of material act related to um, repentance, was itself suspect to the reformers. And they instead just stressed the former part of, of, of sin and forgiveness, reconciliation with God, even in the private recesses of one's own heart. So we see here that the relationship of sin and forgiveness to the material world um, and for the need for sort of material restitution are at the heart of this change. Um, and indeed, I'm just going to make a generalization here for the sake of time, but we can see this here in, um, in the 29 articles, which are still in state in, in the English church. Sorry, 39, 29, 39 articles that much of the problem the problems which reformers had with, with Catholicism was its tendency to overemphasize the material aspects of things. So their main issue with confession was that Christ didn't ever ordain any visible sign to be attached to the ceremony. And because, so the visible sign of the invisible grace for Catholics has to do with um, auricular confession and absolution, the words like pr the priest pronouncing the words of absolution, although Catholics take this to be the visible sign of invisible grace, the reformers said, well, that wasn't instituted by Christ, so confession is not on par with the two sacraments which were instituted by Christ, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. So in these discussions, it is the, the materiality of Catholic worship, its tendency to attach itself, itself to things, acts, uh, rituals, Oh, which was much of the Reformation, constituted much of Reformation concern. We see this, of course, uh, most immediately in the, in the serial ways of, waves of iconoclasm that take place in English Reformation. This is a woodcut from um, Fox's Acts and Monuments, um, colloquially known as Bo Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I couldn't find a higher resolution image, so I'll just have to read the captions for you. At the top here, you have a temple or a church and people carrying things away. Um, it says the temple is well purged. The papists are packing away their poultry. Uh, ship over your trinkets and be packing you papists on the ship of the Romish church. So you see here, they're taking away, um, there's a crucifix here, there's a statue, there, uh, there's a censer. Um, they're taking away all the stuff associated, like the liturgical items and the figurines and the art, and they're packing it away and sending it off. Um, and then at the very top, we have a man pulling down a statue of the Virgin Mary and a fire which says burning of images. So this wave of icon these waves of iconoclasm, which we see figured here, uh, was one response to this persistent and troubling materiality that was associated with an old way of worship. And the idea here was that a reformation was a purgation a getting rid of all those extra things which are not needed. And so we have down in the lower left hand, the king with the sword um, signifying um, the, the, the scriptures, handing the Bible down to, um, to uh, so, so members of the Church of England. And then we have on the bottom right, the purged temple with two things. First, an altar with just a chalice and bread. And second, a baptismal font. So symbolizing here um, the um, pared down um, mere Christianity of the, of the Reformed Church with just those two sacraments. But the point was that all these sort of vestiges of an old way of life and of an old way of thinking were hard to get rid of in full. We have Catholic imagery in the art and architecture stained glass and painted cloths from the late medieval period, badges and coins, embroidery, tapestry, paintings, 
household figurines, jewelry, personal seals, manuscript eliminations, all of these things, all these aspects of the cultural landscape still retain some iconography of the old religion. So the point here is that despite waves of iconoclasm, the English Reformation took a long time to effect culturally. And we could argue that this purgation of the persistent Catholic materiality never actually came to completion. So some reformers took another approach. And I'll give an example of this approach um, by giving a little um, anecdote about um, the theater. So after the Act of Supremacy, Henry VIII dissolved all the monasteries in England. That means he, um, he broke them down. He took them apart. He liquidated all their assets. So some of the assets of the monasteries were uh, priestly vestments and liturgical materials. These things were sold to the highest bidders. Often, the highest bidders were, surprise, surprise, theater companies. They would use these materials in anti-Catholic plays that were at times commissioned by the crown. So what we see here is a different approach to doing away with that stubborn, troublesome material aspect of Catholic worship. And it has something to do with revising the way these things um, come across. So imagine what this might have been like. So you're a Catholic Englishman before the Act of Supremacy. You go to Mass. You see the liturgical items. You see the priestly vestments. They signify for you um, ecclesial authority, uh, uh, something very weighty and something very meaningful. Then the Act of Supremacy comes, the Mass is outlawed, and you don't see it for maybe a handful of years. And then you go to the theater one night, and you see those very same things again. Only in a wildly different context. Okay, you see the priestly vestment, but the person wearing them is not a priest. It's an actor. You see the liturgical materials, but they're not the real things. They're properties. You see these things again, but rather they signify what they signified before. They mean something completely different. They mean an illusion. Um, a deception, an act of theater. So on the part of the reformers, this rhetoric was highly effective. Without altering or purging or destroying these materials in themselves, they rewrote them with new meanings. These clothes become ironic. Uh, they become criticisms of themselves. They become their own commentary. So something really philosophically deep was going on on the stages of early Reformation England. And it was happening on the level of these signs, these, these properties that had been reused and repurposed. Theater theory holds that everything on stage is actually a sign, a sign of the real, of the real world off stage. So when two actors kiss each other, they don't really love each other. It's a sign of two characters who love each other in real life. Okay, so a stage kiss is not a real kiss. Um, an actor is not a real person. It's always a sign of something that is real, a reality beyond it. And on the stage, signs are always less real than the reality to which they point. So the reality to the fiction is more real than the stage itself. When we watch a play, it means we're reading the properties, the images, the, the materials on stage for their real reference, what they really refer to. And it's because of this that I propose the theatrical gaze is actually iconographic in the way it works. I mean icon by iconographic, I mean icon iconography in the religious sense. Icons are images that we look through in order to glance at something more real. So when we read an icon, we see through it in the same way we might see through props and costumes on the stage. So icons are often described as windows or books um, because we read them in order to understand something else behind, beside them. So for example, um, in the iconography of St. John the Baptist, we understand St. John the Baptist by the gesture of pointing either to Christ or to a lamb. <clears throat> 
And as I'm going to describe or talk about later, we understand St. Mary Magdalene as a figure with long unbound hair. So the gesture of pointing and the long hair are cues by which we read these persons. They're sort of markers that we understand some identity or some reality beyond. The important thing about icons is that we have to be taught how to read them. So we have to be taught that the pointed finger means John the Baptist and that the, the long unbound hair means Mary Magdalene. So in an age of relatively low literacy and certainly limited access to the Bible, Shakespeare's audiences would have been taught to read icons at a very early age. In fact, they would have learned the scriptures through these images. The story of salvation as they knew it was a visual one. Creation, fall, sacrifice, redemption. These were visual, not literary topos for Hamlet's first audiences. So when we talk about this iconographic mode, the idea is that certain emblems mean certain things. It's almost like a code. And it's really important that this type of seeing was something that applied equally to the stage as to the church. There's a lot of evidence I could cite for this, but I think just one anecdote will show. Shakespeare had a contemporary called Christopher Marlowe, who wrote a play called Dr. Faustus, which tells the story of a magician who sells his soul to the devil. In the first performances of Christopher Marlowe, the actor playing Faustus would wear a crucifix under his costume. Okay, it wasn't seen, it was meant to be seen. It was meant to be protection against actually invoking devils and actually selling himself to the devil, which he was performing on stage. So we can see here that the difference between the stage reality and the reality to which it points, or the signs and the reality to which it point, was not all that different. Um, that they were dangerously close. The stage was thought to have real life purchase. And it's for this reason that the reformers um, decried the stage just as much as any other art form in the ways of iconoclasm. So then we can see a similar sort of rhetorical development. The stage is decried as um, superstitious by the reformers, and so too is the Catholic Church. Effectively, um, these two become symbols for one another. The stage and the sacristy echo one another, and both of them have signs that are emptied of their real-life purchase by the rhetoric of Reformation. So the Mass was and always has been a performance, but for Catholics, it's a performance that actually has real significance. It has real purchase. It does something to reality. But in the rhetoric of Reformation, the Mass becomes only a performance, nothing but a performance, a sham, illusion, a deception. So what the Reformers achieved so effectively was a different way of reading these signs, these signs religious and these signs theatrical. No longer did we account, did, can you count on the fact that, say, a priestly vestment signifies authority. No longer was it given that it would. Rather, this sign, say, take of the priestly vestment on stage, points back to itself. It draws attention to how many layers of meaning it has. It begs skepticism. It suggests that it could be other than what it claims to be. Um, this sign is a reflexive signifier. It doesn't allow us to see through it, to take it for what it is but it throws our gaze back on itself. There's a, one of the foremost scholars of Shakespeare and Reformation, Houston Deal, says that this disruption of the devotional gaze, which was part of the rhetoric of Reformation, effectively interrupts the process of, of trusting signs to be what they are. So she says, quote, Instead of arousing awe or eliciting adoration, reformed artists make their viewers self-conscious about how they see and, in effect, reform vision. I think this is really important. Self-consciousness about how we see is a means of reforming vision. 
Okay, this is taking us a long way from Hamlet. I am going to get back to Ophelia right now. But the reason I've taken us to this little rabbit trail is to signal how much of Shakespeare's work I think is lost on us simply because of the way we see. When he staged his plays, his audience members would still have been familiar with the iconographic mode of seeing. And it's no coincidence that the Shakespearean canon is absolutely riddled with anxieties about the difference between the way something appears and what it really is, with hypocrisy and illusion and metatheatricality and all these sorts of things. But I think for us to read Shakespeare well, for Shakespeare to come alive to us, we have to at least try to recover this way of seeing. And this is exactly what I'm going to do in returning to Ophelia. We left her on stage with her hair down, singing snatches and carrying a lute. A rare and unusually specific stage direction suggests that these visual cues are important, but we don't know why. I think if we try to look at Ophelia here through the eyes of one of Shakespeare's audience members, this, this mark of unbound hair, and indeed also the mark of the lute, but I'm not going to go into that tonight, um, would evoke a, fi a familiar iconographic topos, that of St. Mary Magdalene. Medieval legend held that Mary Magdalene was born to an aristocratic family, and she fell into sin, and the implication is prostitution, by the love of luxury and her um, indulgence in sort of uh, the, the pleasures of the flesh and her greed for material things. In this backstory, her long unbound hair had been a means of tempting, uh, of alluring men into her love. Um, and it also echoed the serpentine tresses of the, um, of the medieval trope of luxuria, one of the seven deadly sins, um, the sin of lust. And also, of course, with obvious visual allusions to the serpent in the garden, the father of lust. So we see here, Mary Magdalene at the feet of Christ in an, a medieval 14th century uh, manuscript illumination. And we can see here, even here, how her tresses have this sort of serpentine appearance that echoes the fact that once they were used as means to sin. But it's really important that in medieval representations of Mary Magdalene, her hair is a really important part of her sanctification. So here we have a different manuscript illumination one which shows Mary Magdalene before she repents. She's clothed in scarlet and purple and ermine. Her hair is down. She's holding an ointment jar, which makes us think, you know, she's beginning to contemplate repentance. But we have another image of Mary Magdalene at her assumptions. The legend had it that she was assumed in heaven. And here she's not clothed at all. The legend had it that after Christ's ascension, and a brief period of evangelization, Mary Magdalene fled into the desert and lived as an ascetic, um, denying all the pleasures of the flesh. And of course, her nudity here signifies her asceticism. In a sort of miracle of modesty, her hair grows so long and thick as to cover her completely, such that in typical medieval representations of her assumption, She's entirely covered by hair. I like it that scholars call this the Harry Mary trend. <laughs> so Harry Mary. Here again is Donatello's more, you might say, ascetic presentation of Mary Magdalene. A skeletal figure covered entirely by hair. So what we have here is an essentially affirmative theology of matter. What was the means to her sin has become the matter of her sanctification. It's not surprising then that with the Reformation, iconography of Mary Magdalene changes significantly. <clears throat> Mary's hair is not quite so clear here. And I think the best illustration of the Renaissance Mary Magdalene trend comes from Caravaggio's three portraits of the saint. He paints three portraits of the saint in 15 years. 
which just goes to show, I think, how important the saint's iconography was to Reformation. In this first portrait, we see a penitent Magdalene. Really humble figure crouched over. We can barely see her hair. It's certainly not a means of um, temptation here. It's unbound, but it's almost as if it's like unbound in sackcloth and ashes. So this is clearly a penitent Magdalene. Or is it? In the foreground, we have here the, the, the items of her former dalliance. We have perfume. We have pearls. We have jewels. So has Mary Magdalene cast these aside and rejected them? Or has she kept them at arm's length in case one day she should want to put them back? The point is, Caravaggio doesn't, doesn't answer this question for us. He leaves it open-ended. As he does here with his second illustration, here Mary's hair is up. Okay, so has she reformed? Has she bound up her hair, which was a means of temptation and a sober attempt to lead a saintly life? Maybe. Her hair is curled. There's a comb in the foreground. There's a jar which might have the ointment of her, of her a sort of scene of repentance which she pours on the feet of Christ. Or it could have cosmetics in it. We don't know. The things themselves mean two different things. This is again the case in his last depiction of Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. Exactly what kind of ecstasy is this? She has long hair. Is this a symbol of her repentance, or is there something more sensual at work? She is half unclothed. Is this because she's the ascetic um, of the medieval legend, or is there something a little bit different at work here? Uh, the fact is, again, Caravaggio doesn't answer the question. He leaves it unanswered. But what is, he is doing with the material aspects of Mary Magdalene's iconography is disrupting the process by which we would interpret certain cues, namely the cue of her unbound hair, in certain ways. Because he's giving them new meanings. He's making them mean two different things at once. And in doing that, he's making us self-conscious about how we see. He's making us reflect on how we see. So I think Shakespeare joins these Renaissance artists when he stages Ophelia as, as somebody with unbound hair. But before I go on, I want to clarify two things I'm not arguing. First of all, I'm not arguing that Ophelia is an icon. Not like Shakespeare's populating his stage with little uh, religious figures. That's not, that's not what's going on here. Um, Rather, I think Shakespeare is using Ophelia's unbound hair and also her lute, um, which is for another lecture, um, to evoke this idea of repentance as personified in the Magdalene figure as one part of the conversation about repentance that we see permeating Hamlet. The other thing I'm not arguing is that Ophelia is a Magdalene, that she's a fallen woman in need of repentance, or that she is repenting. Um, I think any argument along this line is speculative because all we know of Ophelia is what the play gives us and the play doesn't give us any certain indication in that direction. Again, Ophelia is meant to evoke, to echo, to draw attention to the way we see and not necessarily <laughs> to tell us anything about <laughs> who she is as a character, not to provide a fully well-rounded persona. So I said that Shakespeare externalizes the theme of repentance in the image of Mad Ophelia, in particular by using her unbound hair to evoke the theme of repentance as personified by Mary Magdalene. I think this is, um, this is a, a reading which does justice to the play because repentance is a central concern in Hamlet. And so for Ophelia to properly form the sort of a complement or foil to Hamlet, it would be perfect if she stood as an emblem of this topic. So repentance, especially sin and its material fallout, are central topos in the play. 
In the beginning, we see that one person's guilt, the guilt of Claudius, manifests itself in another person's madness. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, and it's corrupting the whole land. So we can understand there Ophelia's Magdalene imagery to be in conversation with a play that, with these questions about repentance that haunt the play. We've already mentioned um, this idea of repentance with regards to the ghost who emerges from purgatory, again, a theology closely related to the idea of sin and penance. To urge physical revenge for his murder, again, material restitution for a wrong done, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We see Hamlet struggle with whether or not the ghost should be trusted. After all, he's a student at the university in Wittenberg, we hear. So he, he struggles with the veracity of the ghost. Can this ghost be true? If he's true, then is what he's saying about purgatory true? But I think the real clencher when it comes to understanding the importance of repentance to the play as a whole comes in its central scene. So, a little tidbit about Renaissance dramaturgy. The ideal Renaissance play was informed by the notion of symmetry, so that the most important idea of a Renaissance play can be found by taking the play and folding it in half, and whatever's in the middle is the main argument of the play. In Hamlet, this occurs in Claudius's closet scenes. This is a scene where Claudius is praying in his chamber. It's also, consequently, one of the more boring scenes, so it's often overlooked. But I seem to kind of gravitate toward the boring scene, so let's just go for it. Claudius is in his chamber. So this is the central scene of Hamlet, the important, what I'm arguing is kind of the kernel of the play. I'm not going to read the scene for you. I'm just going to kind of give you a recap of what happens. So we see Claudius kneeling in his chamber, kind of his bedroom. And he's trying really hard to repent of murdering his brother, marrying his brother's wife, and taking his brother's kingdom. But he's really confused. He doesn't know where to turn. He doesn't have an order uh, that leads him through the process of repentance. He doesn't have what we might call the sacramental apparatus. He doesn't have a priest. What Claudius does has, have rather, is his own conscience. So he begins by praying, Oh Lord, please forgive my foul murder. And then he says, wait a second. How do, I, how do I know I'm forgiven? That must be, I must be forgiven now. But how do I know? All he has is his own conscience to assure him of forgiveness. But how does he know it's his own conscience or it's just his wishful thinking? Then he has another problem. Um, how can I be sorry for my sin if I'm not willing to relinquish what he calls the effects for which I did the murder? my queen, my crown, my worldly ambition, my kingdom. So if I don't give up what I took, how can I be forgiven? This is a really common thread we're seeing here. Um, can we make things right with God without making restitution in the material world? Enter Hamlet. He sees the Claudius alone and he draws his dagger ready to kill him. But then he sees, he sees Claudius kneeling a sign of repentance. And Hamlet reads the sign for what it is, that Claudius has repented. And Hamlet, being the student of Wittenberg that he is, says, well, if he's made his peace with God in the secrecy of his chamber, now's not the time to kill him. He'll go straight to heaven. So never mind the fact that he still keeps his queen, his crown, and his worldly ambition. If he's made his peace with God, he's, he's, he's well seasoned for heaven. He uses that nice culinary metaphor. But, so he sheathes his dagger and he walks off stage. And then in the last lines of the scene, Claudius says, My words go up, my thoughts lie here below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So what we understand is he can't repent. He's not sorry. He's not ready to give up the things for which he did. The murder, and most importantly, Hamlet has misread the signs. He's been gullible. He's taken them for what they were. He hasn't looked at them skeptically. 
So then, a few scenes later, when Ophelia comes with her sort of Magdalene echoes um, and emerges as an image of repentance in her mad scene, she echoes these complicated notions of the role of the material world in repentance that we've seen already in Claudius' main scene. So again, if we recall that theatre is not just about dialogue, but it's also about performance, then the way Ophelia looks has a lot to do with her presence and her importance to the narrative. I think really to appreciate how she works in this play, we need to move now past her mad scene, the scene that Tolkien found so intolerably moving, and pass on to her death. And this will be the last main point I'll make before concluding. So Ophelia's death. We aren't told much about her death. We hear about it through Queen Gertrude, who comes on and describes her death. She describes it by a technique called ekphrasis, or the description of an image in words. It's really important that this character, who was a shadow of a character, and just snapshots of a character throughout, ends her life as an image, a verbal image. And the next time we see her, as I said, she's a property. Her body is a prop. I've abridged the speech here of the queen. She says, your sisters drown Laertes. Laertes is um, Ophelia's brother. There is a willow grows askant the brook. There with fantastic garlands did she make. There on the pendant boughs her crown it weeds, clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid like a while they bore her up which time she chanted snatches of old lauds as one incapable of her own distress. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. What I find so fascinating about this speech is the grammar. Yes, the grammar is very fascinating here. Grammar can be fascinating at times. So grammatically speaking, the agent of Ophelia's death is her clothes. Okay, her garments, heavy with their drink, these drunken garments, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. The garments are the cause of her death, grammatically. So again, does Ophelia commit suicide? Is her drowning an accident? Like Caravaggio, Shakespeare doesn't answer the question of intention. Rather, he uses grammar in the same way as Caravaggio uses elements such as light, facial expression, color, posture, to keep the point ambiguous. What he does do is spotlight the material aspects of this scene. Two-thirds of the nouns here refer to stuff around Ophelia when she drowns. The willow, the brook, the weeds, the clothes. One-third refer to her. So quite literally, Ophelia's drowning in this stuff. This stuff which um, the scene as a whole presents as sort of gluttonous, morally deplorable. This scene of luxurious doom reminds us of the sort of dark side of the Magdalene imagery. I'm going to argue that drowning Ophelia then visualizes or externalizes Claudius's own distress when he tries to repent. He cannot divest himself of those effects for which he did the murder. She cannot strip away this sort of figurative luxuria that's drowning her. In both scenarios, the intention is out of the question. Claudius really wants to repent, but he can't. Ophelia, we assume, would prefer not to drown, but she can't get rid of her clothes. So we see here, she's an image, externalization of Claudius' desperation. This queen, this crown, this worldly ambition are weighing him down and threatening the death of his soul. We could even say that this image of drowning Ophelia echoes a general cultural anxiety about confession and forgiveness after it's redefined as non-sacramental. For English worshippers would have had questions. How can I be sure if I don't do penance, I'm not going to be dinged for it later? after life, after death, right? If I do perform penance because it wasn't a priest who gave it, 
How do I know it really works? It really sticks? How do I know I've been forgiven if I haven't heard the words of absolution? So here we can imagine that Claudius is desperation. He's trying to repent, but he has no apparatus to do it. Could have been his audiences too. So I've tried to explain here how Ophelia can be used to echo, not necessarily explain, what's going on in the more wordy and psychological aspects of this very dense play. But I think if we appreciate her for what she is, that is a series of really evocative images, um, this is a way of making her come alive. So if there's one sort of takeaway to this talk and to the Magdalene imagery of Ophelia, it would be the importance of reading Shakespearean drama in its historical moment. Now, I'm not saying that the historical approach is the only way of understanding Shakespeare, the only way that's worthwhile. It's not. But I think all too often in English courses, Shakespeare is looked at for what he can do for us, for how he can make shed light on our current situation, for how he's relevant to us today. I think this can be dangerous because it puts the reader at the center of the encounter with the text. We almost can't look at what the text is because we're so busy looking for what it can do for us. What the historical approach to Shakespeare allows us to do is to focus on something outside of ourself. The text itself, the moment in which it was written, the author, his concerns with certain things and how those concerns are reflected in the text. What this allows us to do is have a certain posture with regard to the text. A posture of openness or of receptivity. What is this text? And what can I discover in it? As opposed to, what can the text do for me? Interestingly, I think that this is the best way in which to encounter a piece of theater. Because this is exactly how theater works. Theater cannot work with an audience full of skeptics. It can only work with the suspension of disbelief when audience members are willing to suspend their disbelief, to get caught up in the story, to lose themselves in the performance. Shakespeare says it himself through one of his characters when he says, for theater to work, it is required you do awaken your faith. So this posture of receptivity, this openness, this willing suspension of disbelief, is, in a way, a faithful or at least charitable way of encountering a text, one which is focused on the other, the other of the text, the other of the, of the author, the other of the moment in historical time. And it's worthwhile to practice on its own. We see here, then, where we could, I could argue for a role of English literature in a liberal arts program such as here at CPC. Shakespeare and secular literature in general, when read according to this method of charitable reading, can become a sort of training ground for good habits of reading that help us to approach all texts on their own terms with openness and receptivity, an approach that's most important, of course, when we encounter sacred scripture. If we look at something like Lectio Divina, we begin by the immediate acknowledgement that what we encounter in scripture is a person and that we are to lose ourselves in that encounter with the person. So the idea of openness and receptivity is crucial to reading the scriptures well. It's also the seat of imagination and creativity. So I think if we really want Shakespeare to come alive, um, then that we have to adopt this sort of posture and openness with relation to him. Any other way of reading it tends to occur to me as a way of making Shakespeare a bore. And I think Tolkien would agree with that. Thank you.
My question is if there's another link in the chain, if it applies to Hamlet in any respect as well. The person of Hamlet? Yeah, or the, the character of Hamlet. Character um, of Hamlet. You know, I'll flesh out the question to see. see um, yeah. You talk about, I, I really like the link between the repentant Magdalene figure, strongly contrasting with the unrepentant Polonius who won't renounce his ill gotten gains. And then I love. I really like how you situate Ophelia between them as the kind of ambiguous victim of the worldly trappings. Did she need to repent? I don't know, but she's like caught up in the same plight. At least that's how I understood what you're saying. Is, are all of these meant to be echoes of a struggle of Hamlet as well? Or is, it, or is this theme a kind of like sidelight in the play? Or do you think it opens up on one of the central... Is, is Hamlet struggling with the same thing? Like, Dragging his feet because he kind of likes the princely lifestyle and he doesn't really want to jeopardize his position. Do you think it goes that far? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do you think it does? I mean, I don't mean to re deflect the question, but I yeah, think there's something more behind it that you could say that would be interesting. Yeah, I don't know because, I mean, there's this kind of lingering question about Hamlet. It's like, why is he delaying? Why does he take so long to do what he does? Yeah. Right. And, I, and I've never really heard a good answer to that. Yeah. I mean, like you can leverage, like, the you know what's funny I wrote my master's thesis on Hamlet I never touched that character itself I always felt like Hamlet was so popular because he's so psychologically deep he's so well-rounded he's so realistic uh, he's so boring but anyway um, he gets so much attention that I thought there's got to be something else to this play besides Hamlet. I mean, you got to get away from the titular character. Maybe you'll find something else. Um, so, um, I don't know. And the other th reason why I think Hamlet is so enigmatic is because uh, we, he, for as much as he talks, we don't always really know what's going on in his head as much as he talks about it. Um, we don't always know, for example, if his madness is genuine. It's probably feigned, or I think he says it's feigned at one point. But um, but he also is kind of like borderline, um, you know, sane, for sure. And the thing about Hamlet that I find so interesting is that it says early on he's a student of Wittenberg. And that he is clearly um, of the Protestant persuasion in, in certain ways. For example, when he doubts the ghost. When he doubts the ghost on the basis of purgatory. He doubts that the ghost who comes was his dad because it couldn't be because there's no such thing as purgatory. And then he doesn't kill Claudius because all, it, all that needs to be done in the situation of Claudius, in his opinion, is for Claudius to make amends in the recesses of, of his heart with God. Okay, again, sort of this idea um, that the interior, um, the, the interior state of a person is enough. Um, so I don't know. I would have to think about that question. I would, my, my, um, my instinct would be to say that, all, that Hamlet is one side and all the rest of the play is another side. Because there is always in Shakespeare two sides of everything, two parts of a plot, um, a foil to every character. Um, he's, he's a playwright who introduces things in twos, at least the important things. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. I'll tell you later if something really enlightening comes up. Sorry. I apologize. You want to go first? No, no, go first. Okay. Yeah. Um, I really, really, uh, I'm, I'm still processing it, but I found it really fascinating, um, really enlightening what you're saying about having a receptive approach to theater, and I think we could extend that to literature. Um, but, and, and it seemed like a little bit of that comes as well from not necessarily having a very clear answer in the text. Like, if it's just, like this is how it is, that might not be as easy to take such a, at least, or at least maybe it's too easy to take a receptive approach. But I guess my question would be, how can someone who is interested in writing facilitate uh, or help 
make that receptacle for it easier for their readers. Does that make sense? Um, should, oh, okay. is it necessarily better to go for a more mysterious, like unclear, ambiguous way that Shakespeare's approach, Ophelia and Hamlet and Claudius, um, or is that maybe, or, or is that how we approach it when we aren't, like as a reader, how we approach something when it isn't clear, this is how we can approach it, but it's not necessarily as applicable when it is clear. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So your question pertains to sort of the writer of fiction as opposed yeah. to the reader of fiction? Yeah. So I spoke of this posture of receptivity, this, this attempt to maintain the mystery as opposed to try to impose a reading that solves it unnecessarily as the posture of a reader. But the quote I used from Flannery O'Connor was actually in the part of a writer. So um, she says that the job of a fiction writer is to capture the mystery of life in the manners or conventions of the novel. So I've always found art in general to be this balance, or you could just say confluence, of creativity, which doesn't like to have boundaries but thrives within it, and boundaries. Okay, so you think about, like, even you think about Shakespeare or the most um, amazing pieces of artwork. Uh, you know, the most kind of like canonical pieces of artwork, they're written within a certain structure, certain confines. And within those confines, creativity comes alive. So I think that's something like what Flannery O'Connor is getting at. That mystery is that sort of element of the imagination, the creativity. Um, that needs and requires the manners of literary conventions to really come alive. Um, but I have next to no experience in writing anything but essays. So I can't really speak to a process of maintaining mystery in, in a piece of creative work. I can identify when I think that happens as a reader. Um, but I, I, would, I would suggest, if you're interested in that, to look more at what Flannery O'Connor says in, in her essay, Mystery and Manners, a book on mystery and manners. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I, just, I was just wondering about the queen. Mm, uh, the queen. Now, did she actually witness this? Queen Gertrude. Yeah. That's a big question. Because, Another question we don't know the answer okay. to. Go ahead. Because it just, I mean, I'm kind of thinking. Well, why don't you save it. her? Why didn't you save her? You know, my question. And then, you know what I mean? She's got all the details. Right. So she takes you know? time to take them out. Okay, so there's a way of love. That's right. And then she, she, she was singing and all this kind, all these details, really, that only a, an eyewitness would have. Right. And then, so, so there's something about the queen. She witnesses the death of her... Of her of Ophelia, yeah. right? and she also witnesses the death of Hamlet. King Hamlet? No, doesn't she witness? Oh, Hamlet. her son yeah, Hamlet. Yeah, she, yes. She witnesses his. I mean, but she, she dies too, doesn't she? She's she actually been around since then. Oh yeah, that's right. They she just kind of all die. That's right. Okay, I should have read the. Book. But that's an interesting yeah. point. No, it's okay. But go ahead. Father. Well, I mean, I was just kind of I was thinking about the, this person, the queen. You know, like she she witnesses the death of. Mm -hmm. her, of Girl, she doesn't do anything, mm -hmm. and and yet she's kind of she's but she's also a, so she's also the cause of the downfall of her son, and the cause of the downfall of of her husband and also her second husband. Yeah. So. So I, what's with her? What's with her? I don't know. Um, but as I said, Shakespeare liking pairs, he writes a closet scene for Gertrude. In which, so Claudius has his closet scene mm. that's unsuccessful. But Gertrude has her equally unsuccessful closet scene where Hamlet comes to her and says, Mom, you've got to repent. Like, you've got to do what's right. And, and she's unpersuaded. So you could look at that. Um, but the interesting thing about the end when they all die. I mean, yeah, it's spectacular theater. But on the other hand, it's also kind of theologically important. We've argued all along that Claudius's one sin pollutes his entire kingdom. It's this understanding of, of the material um, fallout of one person's sin, um, of the sort that we acknowledge as Catholics when we, when we confess a sin, even if it's just something we did in the recesses of our of our mind, we understand it to have damaged in some mystical way the entire body of Christ, which is thus why we need penance um, to sort of restore that relationship. So again, Ophelia doesn't necessarily do something wrong, 
But she's an example, as David had mentioned, of sort of the pollution of the whole realm that's caused by one person's sin. And thus at the end, when everyone dies, we feel as if, okay, we can start again here. It's, not, it's kind of like not enough for Claudius to die. He's polluted everyone. Um, everyone has to die. Um, so, for what it's worth. Dr. K. Okay, so go back to right? He didn't like Shakespeare because he saw Shakespeare too modern. I right? didn't want to read past like the 800s or whatever it was. Um, so, what do you think he saw? I mean, do you think he saw something really ancient and old? Is that the point? Who? Something that, that Tolkien saw. You said he here. didn't like Shakespeare. Oh, here. Like in, in this sure. story that he found so sure. emotional that he sees this something really ancient. Mm -hmm. It might just be that Ophelia isn't constructed as a modern character. Hamlet is, and I think Hamlet is one of Shakespeare's most modern plays. I wrote about that in my master's thesis. So, uh, but Ophelia works really differently. She almost works non-verbally. So you could see how she has sort of echoes with like the Greek tragedy, and you know has all these chorus members that never talk the whole time, but they're present. There's some sort of physical presence that means something. Um, or even kind of in the cycle drama again with this idea of sort of an emblematic appearance. She's not, we're not looking at a character so much in Ophelia, we're looking at a picture, we're looking at an image. And there's a reason she has different elements um, to the construction of, of the visuality of her character. Um, so he didn't like Shakespeare because he was too modern. Well, with that I would have to agree in some sense that he was, he was, he was early modern, he was definitely on the cusp. But there are some of his plays that are rather medieval. So maybe I'll ask Tolkien when I meet him, Lord willing, <laughs> one day. <laughs> yeah, David? This is the first play Shakespeare after that his son, is that right? Mm, I don't know, but his son was named Hamnet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got that early line in the place of the famous one, something that's rotten in the state of Denmark. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. I wonder if one of the kind of deep impulse of Bond plays is Shakespeare kind of throwing up his hands at the whole like Benny Toss of yeah. worldly position and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Yeah, my master's thesis is pretty much on Vanitas and, and Ham Hamlet as Vanitas. Absolutely. Um and yeah, and again as we as I mentioned before with you, I don't think that the theological complexities in this play can be divorced from the Vanitas themes you have there. Think of the grave digger scene, you know, with skulls being thrown about. There's not really a better image of Memento Mori. Yeah, Levi. When you came across all the different parallels between Ophelia and Magdalene, mm -hmm. did one sort of rise above the others as being especially pointed or a good parallel or really representative of their similarities or just beautiful in the way that it's compared? That's a good question. So um, I had mentioned that the lute is also part of Mary Magdalene's iconography. So uh, an early Protestant English play about Mary Magdalene figures her as a lutenist. And in one scene, she's detained off stage. She makes a late entrance because she's returning her lute. And this is sort of an, a suggestion that maybe she's not you know, up to, she's up to no good. So the lute is one of them. But actually, this wasn't, I'm not the only person to have noticed these Magdalene patterns. Cheryl Guilfoyle, who's one of the formal Shakespearean scholars in the 90s, wrote about Ophelia's Magdalene echoes. And I don't remember her article, but one thing that it did bring to mind is Ophelia's flower monologue, which is quite famous, where she comes, she's mad, she comes on to say she has this, um, she has this monologue about different flowers for different people. She gives rue, the herb of rue, to Gertrude, and she says, here's rue. That's for repentance. It's called the herb of grace of Sundays. So here's some for you and here's some for me. So I think that's a really interesting, interesting way in which Shakespeare ups the evocation of, of Ophelia's character because a rue is an herb. But it's also a synonym for repentance. So she saves some of this rue for her. You know, so then we think, what is she rue? 
or um, why she associated with Rue. And it's clear that she gives, the only other person she gives Rue to is Gertrude, who is guilty, as Father Lawrence pointed out, for a variety of things. And the fact that it's the herb of grace of Sundays might, in fact, um, indicate that repentance has this. Repentance is the grace which prepares us for Sunday, right? Confession is the means by which we put ourselves in a state of grace to celebrate Sunday. So I think maybe it's her flower monologue, specifically in the way she deals with Rue, that I think is kind of an interesting echo of this Mary Magdalene trope. In that instance, when she gives the Rue to the queen, that's like one of the queen's sin. <laughs> is there a parallel in the story of Magdalene where she... Can you tell someone else's sin? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Um, so the Mary Magdalene figure um, in the late medieval period, and as Shakespeare's audiences would have known her, was actually a conflation of three Marys in the New Testament. We have um, Mary Magdalene proper. We have Mary, the sister of Martha. The woman who, um, dry, who weeps at Christ's feet and dries her tears with his hair. I'm getting some of these even confused myself. But the woman who anoints his feet with ointment and dries the ointment or the perfume with her hair. And lastly, the woman from whom Christ drove out seven demons. So we have kind of this conflation of all these figures in the Mary Magdalene, sort of the saint, saint figure of Mary Magdalene. Um, so I don't know if there's any sort of legend about her having some sort of prescience about someone's unknown sin, of like pointing out, oh, you know, you're guilty without knowing that. Um, but I do know that she's considered sort of this evangelist after the ascension of Christ. Um, and so she has some role to play in the sort of building up of the church. But I don't know of any specific instances. I'm going to explain that. I, I thought maybe because she was accused of prostitution, when she confesses her own oh, yeah. sin and meditating, that is the sin of the men that she's laying on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's true. Actually, that's a big trope of Gertrude's closet scene, if you ever read it. Um, it has to do with sort of the pollution of everyone by way of Gertrude. All right. Is that where we get the expression, you'll rue the day? I don't know. I mean, we get most of our expressions it, I mean, that are cool from right. Shakespeare, but... But isn't that funny when, when you say, you'll rule the day, you did that mean you will repent or... Yeah, Rue means so repent or regret, right. Right. I don't know if we get the phrase, you'll rue the day from Shakespeare, but rue is a synonym of repent or regret. Regret is maybe a better synonym. Is rue better? Hmm. Maybe it's better. Thank you, Rachel. So appreciate that you've not only brought food to our house and filled my belly, you just filled my head. So that was, that was fantastic. I want to announce that uh, December 7th, we have another CPC3 lecture uh, that will be delivered by Marie-Claire Clausen. Um, she's finishing up a PhD at Notre Dame, um, and she will be presenting a paper. I don't have the exact title yet, but it's something about the Holy Land, Mary, and Advent. So it'd be great if you could come out, uh, look for the advertisements. All right, thank you for coming and have a fantastic evening. Thank you.